Okay, so you want to get faster. Ever since I lost the fifth grade 40 yard dash to Jeremy McBride, I have wanted to know how can I get faster? Now that was over 17 years ago back when kids actually won and lost things, but I in that 17 years have dedicated myself to studying sports science and understanding how to train athletes. I've trained NFL athletes, pro soccer players, and went on to get a doctorate degree all to make this video to tell you how to get faster. So let's talk about the five different ways to train your fast switch muscle fibers. And at the end of the video, I'll have a program example so you can actually see how this all ties together into a real program. Let's go ahead and dive into it. The first way to train your fast switch muscle fibers that you need to be incorporating into your training is dynamic effort work. This is often also called speed strength work. And what it basically means is doing repetitions of strength exercises, but at faster speeds. This preferentially trains your neuromuscular system and those neuromuscular adaptations associated with speed. Examples of dynamic effort work include repeated counter movement jumps with load, medicine ball throws, and just basic exercises like barbell back squats or deadlifts, but performed with higher bar speed. This does require you to reduce the load, and for barbell movements like squats and deadlifts, we typically see a peak power output somewhere between around 60% one rep max and 75-80% to one rep max. If, for example, you've only been training your barbell exercises at very heavy speeds that cause you to go very slow, you might need to reduce that load and focus on moving faster under the bar. When it comes to exercises like throws and jumps where you can actually be explosive and jump off the ground, we actually need fairly low resistance to make these exercises effective. A lot of times whenever I'm programming these, it's just around 10 to 30% of body weight in your hands as you're going through these explosive movements. So that is how we train dynamic effort or speed strength. Moving on to the second way that you should be training your fast switch muscle fibers, we have high rate of force development exercises. Some of the best exercises for training rate of force development are plyometric exercises. This graph is extremely important to understand here. When we are sprinting at max velocity, our foot is only in contact with the ground for less than one tenth of one second. That is far less time than it takes to do a full repetition of a strength exercise, such as a barbell back squat. A back squat might take you two or three seconds to do the concentric portion of that rep, whereas we want to specifically train rate of force development and the rate at which we can produce force in less than a tenth of a second if we want to get the most carryover to specifically improving sprint speed. That means that we need to be including exercises with very short ground contact times and high rate of force development like plyometric exercises like hops and skips and jumps. We need a good variety of these plyometric movements in your program and the specific ones that you choose will depend on your sport and exactly what you're training for. I'm going to include some examples in the program at the end of this video that are specific to sprinting if your main goal is improving your max velocity sprint. If your goal is linear speed development, you're probably going to see a lot of things like power skips and other linear movements like broad jumps and other plyometrics like that incorporated into your program. Importantly, if you're not doing any plyometrics, you don't want to just start throwing a ton in all at once. We want this to be a gradual ramp up so that your body's getting a little bit more each week. A good general volume recommendation that you want to work up to is if you're a beginner, around 80 to 100 total jumps per training session. For a more intermediate athlete, 100 to 120. And for a more advanced athlete, 120 to 140 total repetitions of plyometrics per training session. All right, and the third way that we want to be training our fast twitch muscle fibers is maximum force or maximum effort exercises, meaning something close to your one rep max, very heavy. Now this might be counterintuitive because we just talked about how doing fast movements are more powerful and more specific to speed, but we still need to incorporate max force exercises close to our one rep max to build a base of strength. So depending on where you are with your training and if you're more force deficient or if you're more velocity deficient, you may need to do more of that powerful work that's at a lower percent one rep max, or you may actually need to do more work that's more forceful closer to your one rep max. For example, if you're really bouncy but you're not that strong, you may need to program more work that's very heavy and actually is slow and more grinding. Because for example, you might be force deficient not able to produce a lot of force under the barbell, but you're very quick. If you're the opposite, however, and you're very forceful, meaning you have a really high one rep max, but you're not that bouncy and you're not that quick, in that case, you may do less one rep max high force specific training and more of your training that's powerful and explosive. 
Drop a comment below because I'm curious how many of you guys think you're force deficient versus velocity deficient. All right, and then the fourth way that we wanna train our fast twitch muscle fibers is actually with hypertrophy specific training. Now this tends to be most effective in the off season, far away from competition, because this will temporarily reduce your power output and reduce your speed after doing higher volume hypertrophy work. That's okay, because that hypertrophy work again builds a base that we can build our speed on. So this hypertrophy work is important. For example, training things like squats and lunges for three sets of 12, four sets of 15, higher reps for hypertrophy can help us build that good foundation of size and then we can transition our training to including more speed and then turning that size into being more powerful. Hypertrophy work is also protective, especially if we're incorporating something like the Nordic hamstring curl, which has statistically been shown to reduce the risk of hamstring strains. If we can significantly reduce our risk of injury and save us time from being off with a hamstring injury, that's just gonna help you stay on track throughout the season with your training. Importantly though, these need to be incorporated the right way. In the research, they actually started with a really low volume of training of these Nordic hamstring curls, around two sets of five. Then over six weeks, they gradually built that volume up and it was this protocol that actually reduced hamstring strains, not just incorporating three sets of 10 every week for six weeks. Importantly, this protocol was introduced in the off season prior to the time when athletes typically have a spike in hamstring strain injuries and it was a gradual buildup week to week. I'll link the research study in the description of the video below, but the main point that I want you guys to get is that we need to start slow with some of this hypertrophy work, build up week to week, and then also have some amount of maintenance work throughout the season. But there will still be a natural progression from doing more hypertrophy specific work in the off season and then tapering that down as we ramp up our power and speed specific work in season. And then the fifth way that we wanna train our fast twitch muscle fibers is with conditioning. Conditioning is what allows us to actually be able to recruit our fast twitch muscle fibers, recover between sets, and then keep on recruiting fast twitch muscle fibers and maintaining our speed from set to set in training, as well as throughout the game or the competition that you're training for. Conditioning does not just involve running long distances. That is endurance work and that's not gonna specifically train you to be able to recruit your high threshold motor units over and over again and recover well. We need to actually train the anaerobic systems with specific conditioning. This is also different than your plyometric work. Plyometric work is specific to improving rate of force development. Conditioning is specific to energy system development. Typically your conditioning goes towards the end of your training session when you're already a little bit fatigued. That's all right, we can do conditioning in that state. And that could include things like sled drags, repeated runs at submaximal speed, over under type training where we're training at a higher pace and then we're dropping down to a lower pace. There are a ton of options for conditioning. You just wanna make sure that you're training the energy system that's specific to your sport. If you guys are interested in a conditioning specific video, leave a comment below and I might make that in the future. All right, let's take a look at this program example. Let's look at day one first. What you can see here is that we have a combination of some speed work and some speed strength work. We have some sled sprints. That's just a slightly resisted sprint for about six sets here to start off the training session. Then we're gonna move to a quarter rep barbell squat. We're gonna load that at 80% for a set of four, even though you could do 80% for about a set of eight. Importantly, you want this to be 80% of what you could do for a quarter rep squat, not 80% of your full one rep max squat, because you will be stronger for a quarter rep squat than a full depth squat. This is an exercise that I saw used a ton whenever I was an intern strength and conditioning coach at Ohio State with their Olympic sports and their track and field team. It's joint angle specific to sprinting and allows you to move very quick at the end of the repetition towards the top. Moving down the program, we get out of the sagittal plane a little bit with some lateral bounding jumps for four sets of 20 seconds. And then we're also gonna superset that, you can see C1, C2 here, with a plyometric push-up. What you can probably already see is this is a full body training session. I'm just giving you a two day program example and condensing everything into two days. But if you're writing a full program for someone, especially someone who's training four or five, six times a week, you could definitely break these apart if you want to. Towards the end of this first day, we just have single arm rows, RDLs, and a Copenhagen plank, all strength exercises. This is a preseason program, so I'm okay still having three sets of 10 RDLs here. Even though that might make the athletes a little bit sore, that's okay. I would probably draw that down in volume as we approach the season to more maintenance work. But for now, three sets of 10 of that RDL is probably fine. 
And then a quick overview here of day two, we have a 150 meter sprint, a scissor jump, a hurdle hop, all for what I would consider moderate volume for most athletes. You know, four sets of six, five sets of six. That seems appropriate to me in the preseason for most athletes. If you have someone who's really advanced, they may be beyond this. Or if you have a beginner who's not that adapted to power and plyometric work, you might even do less than this. And then moving down that day two program, we have things like box step up knee drive, a three-way hip strength exercise, side plank abduction, and a calf raise. Again, all strength exercises. This is the preseason, so I'm still gonna be fairly strength heavy in this program. And then as we approach the season, I'm gonna taper off some of that volume and make this really speed specific and drive those sport specific adaptations in season. So by no means do you have to do this exact program. Your program is gonna look different in volume, intensity, exercises, but at least this will give you a little bit of a guideline of what you might want to incorporate into your training program. If you're doing all strength work or all speed work and you're not incorporating all the different elements that we talked about in this video, then maybe go ahead and tweak your program to add in some things that you're missing. Thanks so much for watching guys. I do have other videos on sprint training and speed training, so go ahead and check out my channel for those and also subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and smash that like button. It really helps out my channel. And if you're interested, you can follow along on Instagram as well at The Movement System. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I will catch you in the next one.